um, we have Tyler Davis. Um, Tyler is a German major. Um, and as you will see from his presentation, um, here's somebody whose research obviously has already gone beyond um, his undergraduate research um, and is moving into other languages, languages that are not actually <laughs> offered at IPFW, um, that Tyler has um, taken upon himself to learn on his own um, so that he could advance his, um, um, advance his research. Um, and as you can see from the program, um, Tyler is already making a name for himself in professional organizations uh, well beyond IPFW. So, um, and hopefully everybody, um, his uh, assistant, uh, Dr. Clegg, was handing out um, <laughs> handouts for this presentation, so hopefully everybody has one. Well, it is certainly a pleasure to see all of you here. I thank you for coming out and listening to my talk. Uh, the first thing I would like to point out is in your handout on the very last half page, I guess you could say, is a little section of definitions. Unfortunately, since I'm limited by time, I'm not going to be able to get into all of the terminology I use here, and I assume the majority of you is not familiar with it. So if any clarification is needed, you can definitely refer to that. And certainly, if anybody has any further questions, that is what the Q&A uh, 10 minutes is for. Let's begin. So to kind of get into the subject that I'm working with, we first have to understand a little bit of the country of Myanmar. It's located in Southeast Asia, kind of between Bangladesh, India, Thailand, and China. So it's really, besides this peninsular area down here, it's kind of landlocked up in the north between all these countries. And I'm focusing specifically with the language group within this area here. Now the interesting thing about Myanmar is that although it's slightly smaller than the American state of Texas, there are currently 117 living languages that are discovered. Interestingly enough, the last time that I had looked at these figures, it was 116. And so they're currently still finding other language groups. And these are not dialects. These are actual languages. And uh, we'll get into a bit more of that in a little bit. So this is what is called in the literature, Zoram or Zogam. You have right here the Chin state of Burma, which is where all the uh, individuals from my interview come from. But the Chin people, or the Zo people, kind of go across these borders into northeastern India, into Bangladesh, and they all identify as coming from this collective source, the Zo. And there's really no particular translation for what Zo is. But they all seem to, in the old literature and the old historiography, kind of come from this little word that nobody is quite sure what it means. <laughs> so, so yes, they all, all my participants come from the Chin state. And these are the people of the Chin Hills of Burma. In Burmese, the area is known as Chin Bine, which just means Chin state, but known by the Chin people as Zogam, Zoram, and even a smaller group may call it Lai Ram, focusing on the Hakha language group, which you'll see a bit in a bit later. But linguistic, uh, theological, and even uh, uh, this gentleman here has his PhD in geography, but he wrote a huge book on the history of the Zo. They all argue that they should be called Zo rather than Chin. Chin is kind of the word that the Anglos and the Burmese use to refer to these people. But it's an interesting society. I can't get totally into it because it's very, very, very detailed. But it's a clan society. They are all very tight-knitted into their clan, into their identity, into their language. And everybody knows, usually one of the first questions that they would ask each other if they were to meet other Chin people is, who's your mother? Who's your father? Who's your grandfather? All of this to kind of know where they stand within the community. So, they are very proud of their heritage, and thus, I would assume, proud of their languages as well. So what is the purpose of my research? So I interviewed eight, only analyzing seven here, speakers of uh, languages of the Chin Hills of Burma. And there were two main things that I wanted to look at. Their language attitude, both toward Burmese and toward their L1, and their fluency of Burmese. And I will elaborate on both of those points in just a little bit. But I also kind of wanted to use this to look into a bit more of the sociolinguistic situation of Myanmar. Here you have a country with, I just showed you, 117 living languages all being spoken there, yet there's only one national language that is mandated 
by the Constitution to be put into the education system and used for all official government tasks. So I would like to see how the enforcement of this language really is effective. So I traveled to Indianapolis, Indiana. There is a large population of uh, what the literature calls central chin inhabitants. And uh, for example, Dr. Thompson, Dr. Clegg, and several other scholars from this institution a few summers ago interviewed several Chin individuals from Fort Wayne, but they all kind of come from the northern part of Chin State. These are more central. I was hoping to get a wider uh, range of people, but that is not how things worked out. But I did this through contacting the Chin Community Center, and I was able to use their facilities and interview these participants. So there were three basic types of questions that I asked them. I tried to keep it simple, going in kind of with both feet, not knowing what the actual fluency of these people would be in Burmese. I had to use the Burmese language to interview them because, for one thing, this has to do with the Burmese language itself. And also, at the time, even really now, I don't speak any Chin languages that fluently. So unless they were able to speak English, Burmese is the only thing I could use. But I would ask yes or no questions. Do you speak Burmese? Do you enjoy speaking Burmese, etc.? Demographic questions, what is your ethnicity? What city did you come from? And questions based on attitude. For example, were you punished for speaking your, your L1, your mother tongue, at school? And then I coded each response based on what they give to kind of run a statistical analysis on it. So first we need to kind of look at the languages of the individuals I interviewed as compared to the Burmese language. Um, I kind of gave this for comparison. As I said, the majority of the people I interviewed were from <coughs> Central, but actually one individual spoke from this Moraic branch. So kind of like how there's the major Indo-European language family, we have this major Sino-Tibetan language family. And for example, Chinese is included in this group, but Tibeto-Burman is another branch of it. And that also includes the language Tibetan. But here, you have one, two, three, four generational gaps in between how these languages are even related to Burmese. So although they're in the same greater language family, there's still a huge degree of separation between them. But as I said, that is the language that I used. But now at least you can get sort of a feel for the typology of these languages. So let's look a little bit at the development of them. I had three native speakers of Phalam. One spoke a dialect of Phalam Chin, and that's also from the central group that you saw in the graph there. Uh, they have a Bible, a complete Bible that was translated there. You have a dictionary that was recently published. There, for what I could find, there were no published dictionaries before 2009 for this language, yet the Bible had been there for quite a long time. And there are various, um, various linguistic papers that have been published throughout several decades. Um, you, I had two native speakers of Zodung. And besides a little bit of linguistic research that I found, there's only a New Testament, as far as literature goes, that's widely spread in publication. Hakka, or otherwise known as Lai Hol by the natives, is probably the most developed as far as literature goes, because not only do they have two complete Bible translations, but they also have a dictionary and a written grammar and also various linguistic papers. So, and I'll get into this a bit later because I also asked the participants whether they were aware of this. So I don't want to spend too much time on my fluency scale, therefore I've included it for you in your handouts. But basically, from fluency not measurable, which there was actually one participant who I could not measure his fluency in Burmese due to the fact that he would not respond to my questions in Burmese and required that my questions be interpreted into his native Hakha in order, to, uh, in order to respond. Although he said he did learn Burmese in school and he did use Burmese, he refused to do it with me, which is fine, you know. <laughs> um, but the last, the last category there would have been native-like fluency. The participants' responses were clear and relevant to the question asked, but with elaborations when elicited, there were no mistakes in grammar, 
There was probably one individual that I could have put in this number five category, but they declined to be included in this study, although I interviewed them, which is fine. So the highest level of fluency I actually have is a four. And you can see here. Uh, I couldn't exactly give them you know, direct numbers, but you could see number two is between one and two of levels, and then number eight was a definite four based on my analysis. What I had done is when I interviewed them, I did it orally, and I recorded all of their responses, and I would go back several times and listen to their responses, code several responses that they gave that I could perform t statistical analysis on, and also look to see whether their responses were actually coherent and actually aligned with what questions I had asked. There were several speakers who actually would go off on tangents talking about something that I had not even brought up. And uh, although they did a great job speaking, it was something that I couldn't use because it was ultimately a tangent. <laughs> but um, here are some questions also included in the handout uh, regarding the language positivity and domain usage toward Burmese. Now when I say positivity, this means I had to be quite specific with this because how can you determine whether one is actually has positive feelings about a language or whether they just have okay feelings about a language or whether they're just saying what they think you want to hear? Well, the short answer is you can't. And so basically my definition of positivity is if they don't flat out say, I don't like this, I don't you know, agree with this, etc. That to me just constitutes as positivity. So one question that I asked regarding positivity is, what do you think about when you hear the word Burmese? Uh, and that came actually by reading the literature. There is one Chin word called gol, and that's what they use to refer to a Burmese person. And it's kind of like, it has a, that word itself has a very negative connotation to it. And I wondered if that would also affect the mindset of when they would you know, not only think about the political situation that they were in, but about the linguistic situation. Uh, but I think you'll find the responses for that quite interesting. As far as domains go, um, also in the definition section, basically in what areas, what general areas were the languages used? So for example, in which situations do you use Burmese in the United States? And I also asked in which situations did you use Burmese in, uh, in uh, Burma, number 12. So I would kind of code them like this. And you can see, for example, number 15, which was have your feelings about the Burmese language now changed. Only two of them had uh, said that they had changed their feelings about the Burmese people. But they didn't really give two negative responses to how they felt about that. But as I said, we'll kind of get into the analysis in a little bit. One thing I would like to point out before I start showing my graphs is that when we get to the questions of domain, you see how there are several uh, non-applicable answers. And basically what I had to do was not analyze those people because I wouldn't want to just give them a zero when they did not respond to that question at all. And that also had to do with their amount of fluency and their amount of comprehension. So. Looking here, fluency in Burmese as compared to positivity toward Burmese. Anybody who's familiar with looking at graphs is probably kind of scared by this thing because there isn't much correlation here. And that could say several things. That could say that although they seem to have about, you know, um, what would that be? 75%, it was out of four, 75% uh, positivity toward Burmese out of the four questions specifically asked. Well, that doesn't necessarily um, code toward their fluency now, does it? So does that mean they were telling me what I wanted to hear? Does that mean that, um, you know, that they just you know, were not really sure what their true feelings are, or if it doesn't matter to them? There's no real way for me to judge that without going further into research. And so the majority of this graph uh, just cannot tell us too much, except for the fact that positivity does not necessarily relate to fluency. Now if we start looking at domains, you have this individual here who said he used Burmese in two separate domains, which were specifically with Burmese people if he were going to a Burmese-speaking city and if he were in school, because instruction was in Burmese. And yet 
he did not speak in Burmese in the interview with me, so I couldn't rate his fluency. Now that says something about kind of how his attitude is toward the Burmese language, doesn't it? He had learned it, he had used it, although now, in the United States, he refuses to. Whereas this person here in Burmese had um, given four different domains, school, going into the city, being with Burmese friends, and doing certain things of work. And yet, his fluency wasn't all that strong either. That could mean that he possibly only used Burmese when it was needed to get certain things done. But we also have to kind of look at the current situation. So if we look, we start to see more of a correlation now. Fluency in Burmese as compared to domains in the US, the first participant who was uh, rated at a zero for fluency also said he uses Burmese not at all here. And that included the interview with me. So it kind of matches up that he would have um, you know, a fluency that I could not rate when he uses it in no domains here. And yet you have a person here, you could see in the blue, he listed three domains, and he had a pretty high rate of fluency. Now, if you look over at the end here, where the fluency appears high, yet the domain's low, that also means that we, in the future, should kind of look at how important or how deep kind of these domains run, not just the number of them. For example, I know number eight is a businessman, and he uses um, Burmese quite a bit in his uh, organization down there in Indianapolis, although you know, he only really uses it for speaking with Burmese people and for business matters. But because that is his job, it's very important, and it demands that he has a high rate of fluency. So that is kind of where the correlation can be seen. In regard to their first language, although that was not the uh, specific topic that I wanted to address, I felt it appropriate to kind of pursue it anyway. I had asked several um, similar types of questions. Since you are, insert ethnicity here, can you speak that language as well? And some people may be you know, shocked that I asked that question. Well, shouldn't they? And the answer is, well, not always. I have met people from you know, Chin groups who only speak Burmese or speak Burmese and now they live here, so they speak English too. And that has to do with where they live, how they grew up, how their attitude toward language was presented to them, what the importance of Burmese was toward them. But uh, fortunately, all of these participants actually did speak their languages. They all came from the Chin Hills, not from some of the bigger cities like Yangon or more down toward the heavily Burmese populated areas. They all lived in an area in the Chin state where you could get by almost every day without saying a single word that was Burmese. And then um, domains again in Burma, in which situ situations did you use your ethnic language? And again, that's kind of, you have to look a bit more into how deep that can go because they could say, well, I used it with my family. Well, that's one domain, but obviously th that's very important. So um, one thing that I'd like to point out, though, question 17, I mentioned about the resources available for each language. The question 17 was, is there a dictionary or grammar for your language? And if you remember the participants and their rate of fluency, it was numbers four, seven, and eight who were the most fluent in Burmese, and yet seven and eight were the only ones who were able to actually say, yes, there is a dictionary and grammar in my language, and I do use it. The rest of them were not even aware that such, ex uh, such resources existed for their language, which I found kind of shocking. But again, that goes to what situations would they need to use it? Did they have access to these things? Does it even matter to them? So these are more questions that one could perhaps elaborate on in the future. And so the result is you don't see much correlation <coughs> with these questions. And I think the main problem is there weren't many participants. If I only was, was able to interview eight people, analyze seven, and even cut some people out of the analysis, you're not going to see a huge general pattern after that. But that is, I would say, the problem working with human subjects. So the conclusions that I can make, however, is that for certain individuals, arriving in the US is a factor for 
becoming more fluent in Burmese. Although there are a lot of Hakka, a lot of Falam down in Indianapolis, there are also a lot of other people from Burma. You get people from different cities, from different regions, all kind of together in these states or in these cities here in the United States, and that kind of you know brings the need for a common language between them. And sure, they are still kind of learning English, but they have Burmese a little bit under their belt. And so that brings more use to them, whereas in the Chin state, they could go by without using Burmese at all. But the interesting thing here, the attitudes tor toward Burmese as a language were mostly positive. And that said something, especially when there were uh, about three individuals who weren't that fluent in Burmese. So it just doesn't correlate for one, or it may not be a genuine opinion. There is no way in the interviews that I did, you know, I did not have them hooked up to a lie detector or anything like that. I, I'm not even sure if that's humane. So I, you know, there is no way to exactly tell that, but it would be interesting if uh, in the future, if I were to do something like this again, to kind of find out a way to do that. But also we see that the number of domains in which Burmese was spoken does not necessarily correlate or contribute to fluency. So a better question would be, how important are these domains to you? So suggestions for anybody who would like to do something like this. Make sure you have a large sample size and that you have kind of some control over the selection of the sample to make sure that there is a diverse population there. I had uh, eight individuals. Only one of them was, was female, and she was the one that asked not to be uh, analyzed. And uh, they were all minus one person who was in his late 20s between the ages of 40 and 50. And they all kind of you know, came from the same type of educational <coughs> background except for the one businessman, number eight. So it's good to have a large sampling and also a very diverse sampling to kind of see what the true patterns are here. And also it's important to have extra time, extra funds to do these things, right? I tried, there were several individuals who, they were contacted very late in the game and they had to go to work and things like that. So we kind of had to go through the interview process. This is the challenge of working with human subjects besides working with uh, you know, inanimate objects that can stand still and you can observe them for as much time as you need to. So one other thing is I don't you know, just want me to be doing these kinds of things. I would like to involve the community also to kind of look at these issues, to kind of realize that yes, these issues are important and you face them every day and yet you don't really think about them. Because community members looking in to themselves would probably be more effective than this guy you've never met before suddenly showing up in an office, speaking to you in a language that you don't normally use, and asking you what you feel about it. So there's kind of that degree of separation there. But I end um, saying thank you to the IPFW Honors Program for giving me the opportunity to pursue this outside of my uh, major. Um, also, Professor Shannon Bischoff, Jens Clegg, and Chad Thompson for kind of guiding me and giving me a little uh, hints and tips throughout this whole thing. Um, Dr. Uh, Frederick Lehman Chilhlein and Pat Dong Pui for giving me uh, books and resources to kind of look further into the Chin literature. Uh, pa Oi Sang, who is the leader of the Chin Community Center. I thank my participants who are not here. But lastly, I thank all of you once again for coming and for, uh, for listening to this. So thank you very much. Yes? How is uh, Burmese institutionalized to be used as a lingua franca across Burma? So it is the official language of the government and also the official language of education, although, for example, in the Chin state, usually up until the fourth standard, so fourth grade, there is one subject that is taught, which is their mother tongue subject, but it's not official in the government, so really anybody who teaches the mother tongue has to kind of come up with the curriculum themselves. But Burmese is the language that's enforced in all aspects of the country, the, you know, as many people know, the country is not even called Burma anymore. It's called 
Myanmar, and that also comes with a linguistic and a cultural identity saying, you know, we're not this and this and this and this and this, but we are, but we're all Myanmar people, right? And according to the linguistic literature, that's kind of actually not, that's a political ideal, not really a linguistic or anthropological ideal, totally politically uh, involved, but it is the official language. The problem is, especially in the Chin state, you have tons of mountains and everything everywhere. And so historically, the Burmese weren't always able to go up there and kind of, you know, attack and pillage the Chin people because they had all these mountains that they had to deal with. So they were able to kind of keep their autonomy for quite a while. But in general, the Burmese language is enforced in the entire country of Myanmar. Uh -huh. And I wanted to ask you what linguistic literature you use. That's my first question. Sure. Another question, how do you distinguish between a language and a dialect? Because in the, because in, when you were talking about the demographic data, yes. you, uh, you mentioned that you introduced some native speakers and some dialect speakers. Yeah, you're talking yes. about this right here, right? Yeah. So I, I, I'm not clear, I don't understand, like the dialect person spoke a dialect and the other two, what do you think? Okay, very good. Um, to answer the first question. Yes, the linguistic yeah. literature. So the linguistic literature is kind of diverse. You have papers mostly written just on individual languages and then it's kind of odd because certain papers who try to talk about the entire Chin linguistics, right, really do only focus on one language using the uh, etymological uh, roots and stuff of that one language to speak for them all. So uh, they would say, for example, um, in Lai Hol, uh, or the Hakha language there, they would call themselves Lai, and then they would call the, the Chin of the North Vai, which means something else, and they would call the Burmese Kol, and they would use these things to kind of set the identities, but that's one group, right? So there are uh, linguistic papers that focus mostly on phonology. There are also some that focus on the origin of their names. And there's also a lot of work done to kind of come up with a proto-language where they all came from. And, but mostly, I would say, to find out about them culturally, I had to read um, historiographies of them. Sure. That's sure. So that's the literature I'm asking about. There, well, that's the thing. Uh, I looked and looked and I found no uh, literature of language attitudes among the Chin people. Of course, uh, Dr. Thompson and Dr. Clegg, they have done research, but uh, it's not been officially published yet. So I could not access that just yet. But. I'm, I'm not talking about the linguistics of the language because we don't work with that. We right, only right. work with language attitudes and language acquisition. Sure. Yes, of course. And what about the, the language and the dialect? Yes. How do you see those? So, within Falam, and really within all of these languages here, Hakha and Lai also, you have kind of, you have the main language. So Falam is considered, you know, one language, just like American, standard American English is considered one language. And then you have the varieties coming off of that but only one participant acknowledged that he spoke a dialect of Falam, right? And this was hard actually to find out because he said, as far as his ethnicity, that he was Hakha. But in all of the literature, uh, his language, which was called Kwalzim, is related linguistically to Falam and not to Hakha. So Kwalzim is a dialect of Falam. It is a lower form of Falam and not of uh, Hakka. Okay, so you're thinking as languages as something that are above dialects or something like that. Yes, okay. yes. Mr. Miller. Um, you touched on this, but uh, could you elaborate on the origin of these two names for the country and their significance, why they're different, I guess? Sure. Um, so, and this kind of goes way back. There's a lot of theories about this. Um, Basically, what happens in now the political literature is that they refer to 
um, a very old work called the Glass Palace Chronicles, where it mentions these Myanmar people kind of coming from, let me see if I can get the map back up real quick here. So here you have Myanmar, and they say kind of within the Rakhine Magwe division, whatever, there were these people called the Myanmar people. And they, in an attempt to kind of unify the country, while it was still under the military junta, mind you, they, they said we shouldn't call ourselves Bama anymore because Bama refers to the ethnic people, the ethnic Burman people who come from this area. We need to be united. We need to include the Chin and the Shan and the Kaya and the Kayin and all of them. So we will call ourselves under this larger identity, Myanmar, and they use that source as their kind of reasoning for that. I've spoken to linguists who deal with that that say that's kind of a bad argument to make because Myanmar comes from a specific <coughs> dialect of Rakhine where if you go back into the Proto languages, it has the exact same root as Bama. So really, you're not getting anywhere with that. And, but that's kind of the origin of it. Like I said, it's politically motivated. It's to give kind of a new identifier to the people. And it's really ignoring the actual roots of it, which are the same as the roots of Bama, Burmese, Burman. Yes. Um, <laughs> So uh, one, of, one of the questions that you ask uh, everyone is, uh, you know, attitude about L1, attitude about Burmese. Um, did you get any sense during your conversations about whether or not they thought of themselves as bilinguals as, or as trilinguals since a lot of them are speaking English or maybe they speak four languages or five languages given the, ba the number of languages there? And uh, any sense about thinking, you know, between, you know, rather than, you know, these poles, like thinking between and using all of these together? Right. Um, this was an interesting thing, and I had to be careful in the way that I analyzed this. Sometimes it would come up in conversations, but other people who just were not uh, uh, as competent in Burmese, they weren't able to give much of a response to this. I had asked them originally one of the questions, since you know, between your time of living in Burma and coming to the United States, have you acquired any other languages? A frequent answer was Malay, because they had lived in refugee camps in Malaysia. but. Um, some people would refer, when I would ask them, you know, what languages all do you speak, instead of saying, you know, Hakka or Falam, they would just call it Chin. And then they'd say, oh, and I understand a little bit of Tidim too, but Tidim is also a Chin language. So in their mind, this is kind of, and that's also politically motivated, which I didn't really get into. But um, they, they would, you know, they would mention that they could speak these languages, but I kind of had to uh, press a little bit to see if they did. So, you know, yeah, I lived in Malaysia. Oh, do you speak Malay? Oh, yeah, I speak Malay. I lived there for five years, you know, but they would not mention that initially. I had to kind of press that, and, you know, what about your English? And all of them, well, besides one person, all of them said, oh, I just speak a little bit of English. And one person said, I don't speak English at all. I'm just kind of here. So <laughs> it, I would get such variant answers, I wouldn't really know in the data how to analyze them. Um, even given the results that I could analyze and how sporadic they are. But uh, they, were, um, they were aware that they were bilingual, and they were aware of the different languages they spoke. One thing that I would change if I were to do this again, I asked them, how did you learn Burmese, right? And for us, you know, learning could mean, you know, in school, it could mean, you know, going out with your friends and, you know, speaking Spanish all the time and something, and then boom, you've acquired Spanish. For them, if I use the Burmese word learn, they automatically associate it with school. So they might have said, I did not learn Burmese in school. Obviously, they speak it. So they learned or acquired it in some other way that didn't have to do with school. And so that was kind of the thing. You had to really know how to ask these questions and how to elicit what they actually were and that's kind of where the ambiguity came in. Yes? How are speakers of these languages faring in the current political liberalization in Burma? Because often when dictators, when, when authoritarian political systems open up, sometimes minority groups benefit a lot from the new freedom and autonomy, but sometimes 
kind of hurt by it because grievances are reignited and conflict increases. Right. Um, and are you referring to the refugees living in the United States? Or I was thinking of in, in Burma. What in Burma? Question, yeah. um, it's kind of a mixture. I, of course, didn't look at this, but I do know some right. of it. Yeah. Um, you know, you just had kind of an onslaught in the Kachin state that happened just a few weeks ago. Suddenly, everybody's Facebook pictures went black over it. Uh, you still have a lot of pressure from the Burmese government to kind of make people assimilate and to, uh, you also have a lot of pressure from China for people to, you know, allow them to drill oil for oil in their uh, land or drill for diamonds or for jade. You know, there's a lot of jade up in the Kachin state that China wants to get a hold of and pay Myanmar to let them get a hold of it. So you have, not even linguistically, but also politically, a lot of pressure on these groups, but language certainly does um, pro does play a large role because, you know, with the whole everybody should speak Burmese, everybody should consider themselves as Myanmar instead of these groups, you know, we're working for the common cause here. We need to be together in this, yet at the same time they're allowed to do their traditional festivals, they're allowed to sing their traditional songs, worship in the religion that they want to as long as they don't question the Buddhist authority. So it's kind of a mixture, and there have been many studies actually who've dealt with this, and I only kind of know it at surface value from what I hear from the community. But there are also people in the United States who are refugees who are very uh, into kind of activism for that. Others who just, even in Burma, who just still kind of keep quiet about it because at the end of the day they still need to go eat and they don't want to, you know, stir up a lot of trouble with these things. So for a lot of people, it's just not really something they think about because they can't really afford to. Not to mention eating. Um, yeah. and since we are at our 10 minute uh, question mark. Fortunately, Tyler will be um, you know, eating, yes. so if you, anybody else has questions, they'll have a chance to um, ask him. So let's do a round of applause for Tyler. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming today. Thank you for um, for uh, for the wonderful questions you asked that, of course, uh, contributed to, um, uh, to to the proceedings. And so, round of applause for you. Thank you.